In terms of disclosure, one of the projects I'll present today was funded by Ingredion. Well, it was 2006, so it was part of ICI Chemicals. But to mitigate that, all the data I'm presenting today is all from peer-reviewed publications. So where are we currently? Well, I had a quick look last night at the current American and UK guidelines for resistant starch. And not surprisingly, resistant starch is mentioned by the ADA but only to say that there are no long-term published trials, and that's it. Uh, they do glance at it. But that's better than the, the British, who actually don't make any reference to resistant starch at all in their nutritional guidelines for diabetes, and these were published in 2011. So we've still got an awful long way to go to try and convince anybody to do anything, really, with resistant starch. Now, listening to Mike's study, you may think all the work's already been done, but it, it hasn't really. And what we do need to remember, that animal models are often just hypothesis generating. They're not usually predictive of the, what the response will be in a human. And like all translational research, some of these hypotheses will prove to be proven, but other will prove to be false. And, and that's, where we, that's where we're coming from, really. In order to change public health and dietary guidelines, we have to be able to demonstrate efficacy in the target population, which is obviously the human. Okay, so why do we tend to use supplements with resistant starch? Well, a lot of the, the kind of the, the criticisms by organizations such as the ADA is that a lot of the benefits are not seen until you get to very high intakes often in excess of maybe 50 grams per day. So this is what 40 grams per day of fibre actually looks like. So if you were to sort of give this to somebody, they may be slightly overwhelmed by it, but you could give them the same amount of fibre as resistant starch, and they could quite easily incorporate it into their diet, as we tend to do with supplements, or in the future, use this as a functional food ingredient. Okay. Obviously, there are other benefits to using supplements, we can remove a lot of the effects of GI and, as Mike said, energy dilution. So we start to look at what are the metabolic, metabolic effects of resistant starch per se, which is quite important. But often, we can run them then in a similar design that we would with a, a normal randomised clinical trial. And it's very hard to do that with a normal nutritional intervention. So most of the studies I'm going to present today have been done with supplements, most of them with type 2 resistant starch, with a high maize resistant starch. And although I will mention a couple that have started to use food-based research using the, the resistant starch incorporated into food products. Okay, so what we have is research from a various gradient of different sort of health status or reducing insulin sensitivity or reducing glycemic control and also in a variety of methods. Now we heard a, a bit about methods yesterday. Some methods are considered gold standard, others aren't considered gold standard but often these methods are very complementary to each other and each one will tend to provide different information which we can add together to try and get an, an overall picture with what is going on. So really, I think we were probably one of the first groups to, to kick-start this sort of work with, with resistant starch back in the, the mid-2000s. And what we did is simply a, a randomised control trial, and Mike briefly touched on it, where we had 30 grams per day uh, of type 2 resistant starch, four weeks, we did hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps, we also did a postprandial meal tolerance test, with arteriovenous, arteriovenous something. And what we found, we found we actually, despite using what were considered reasonably healthy participants, we did get an improvement in insulin sensitivity, okay? 
If we'd not found anything, that probably would have been the end of my resistance starch career. Unfortunately, it worked. So that has kind of filled in the last decade of my life, really. So there's been a few follow-ups now, again, with, I will call them healthy populations because they're not pure metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, but often they're quite mixed groups. So this is a more recent study. This is a more recent study by Mackey. And what they did is they had a, a mixed group of 33 individuals. And when they characterized them, about 50% would have been metabolic syndrome and 50% healthy. So a bit of a mixed bag. They had men and women, and they had two different supplement periods. So it was a, a three-way crossover for four weeks. Interestingly, they found an improvement of both 15 and 30 grams per day, but only in men. They didn't find an effect in women. Okay? And that in itself is very interesting because obviously you can't have a, a dietary guideline for 50% of the population. You know, it, we need to kind of work out why was it just in men, why didn't it work in the female group. Okay, so this was with uh, intravenous glucose tolerance test. Now, these three studies are all in insulin resistance and they're all from our group. And what we tended to do, we tended to recruit people who had baseline very high fasting insulin levels. So we could almost guarantee that they had tissue insulin resistance, okay? They tended to be normal glycemic, so they hadn't started to become impaired fasting, sort of impaired, okay? So in these three studies, they all had the same dose, so each of them was 40 grams per day, but you'll notice that they're for different durations. So we started off with 40 grams per day for 12 weeks. Again, we used the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, and we found a, roughly a 20% increase in insulin sensitivity. Okay? So this was a very similar magnitude of response to what we had found with our healthy individuals. Okay? So that was all very, very positive. In the next study, we thought, right, so we did it for 12 weeks and that worked. What's the kind of the minimum length of time you would need to put someone on one of these supplements to actually find an effect? So in the next study, we again did same dosage, but this time we only did it for eight weeks. So eight weeks, again, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clam. This time we were getting a bit clever. So we added some stable isotopes to it to try and differentiate between whether it was peripheral insulin sensitivity or whether it was the sensitivity of endogenous glucose production that was changing. It turned out, again, 17%, so roughly, roughly the same magnitude of response, but the effects were entirely peripheral. There was no effect at all on liver glucose production. We did find, because this time we also incorporated it with arterial vena sampling, that we found a 65% increase in glucose flux directly into forearm tissue, which is primarily muscle. And we did find differences in fasting glucose control. And that's the first time we'd ever found that. Usually we hadn't found any differences in fasting glucose or insulin. So the next study was four weeks. Would we get an effect after four weeks? We got an effect in healthy individuals after four weeks. Uh, no, we didn't. So we used a different methodology this time. We did the frequent sampled intravenous glucose tolerance test. No effect on insulin sensitivity at all, okay? So very disappointing, first negative result. But we did find a, a dramatic improvement in first phase insulin response, okay? And what we heard yesterday, often you've got that balance between sensitivity and beta cell function. There was also a, a non-significant increase in glucose effectiveness, which implied there was potentially something going on which was insulin independent. And again, we did find this drop in fasting glucose. There's been a couple of uh, more recent studies, this time starting to use uh, food-based research, because realistically, if something like resistant starch is going to be used, isn't, is going to be rolled out, you're not going to want to start sprinkling powder over your breakfast cereal. You are going to want to try and bake it into products and incorporate that into people's diets naturally. 
So this is a, a study that's been done recently and has just been published as part of an MSc. And they used, again, type 2 resistance starch, eight weeks where the resistance starch was baked into bagels versus a control bagel. So again, they had an appropriate control. They found a reduction in fasting glucose control. Okay, so they did find something. Uh, another study, which is slightly older, this time using bread, longer period, but a much lower dose of resistant starch, only seven and a half grams. And perhaps from what we experienced after 2010, not so surprising that they didn't find an effect with such a small dose. Okay. So in terms of, of our own data, there was something that happened between four weeks where we had no improvement in insulin sensitivity and eight weeks where suddenly you've got a 20% improvement. Okay, so four weeks isn't long enough, eight weeks is. We don't quite know what the optimum, optimum level is. But this is some of the, the data from that study. And so it's making us think, is this first phase insulin secretion improvement potentially an important first step in getting later improvements in insulin sensitivity. So if we look at some of the data from that study, so we have a, a mean 41% improvement in first phase insulin. We got a, a mean 30% improvement in glucose effectiveness. But interestingly, our insulin sensitivity actually went down. You know, 7%, it, it wasn't very good at all. And for those of you that are suspicious of modelling, and I'm suspicious of modelling, you know, when I review papers, I like to see the numbers, I like to see the curves and the data. We can see quite a dramatic difference in our actual C-peptide raw data between the two interventions. So the resistant starch has got almost a doubling in your, in your C-peptide raw data. So we were quite happy that we are getting something definite going on here with, with the insulin secretion. Now, we also tend to be getting these very large and dramatic increases in, in glucose uptake directly into forearm muscle. Okay, so this is not a postprandial level. This is actual flux when you measure it going into, into a muscle tissue directly. So in this study, we got a 60% increase in glucose uptake. And of course, that is much higher than the increases we're getting in insulin sensitivity by clamp. We don't really understand why you're getting the difference. These differences are very big, okay? These are bigger differences than you get with many of the pharmacological treatments for diabetes, okay? Because we've done similar methodologies with, with many of the drugs, with rosiglitazone, things like that. So this is a very big, big increase. So we can only assume the difference is either to do with some sort of gut-derived factor, because this is the non-steady state, this is a postprandial test, or you've got some very non-insulin mediated mechanism which we haven't yet defined. Now recently we, we thought we would try and translate this into type 2 diabetes because obviously this is a, a quite a, an important target group and we thought well, we'll go back to the, the dose and the length of intervention that we know works in insulin resistant. So it was 40 grams per day for 12 weeks. Disappointingly we had no effect on insulin sensitivity in this diabetic group, okay? We had no effect on endogenous glucose production, which wasn't a surprise because we hadn't in the past. We did continue to get this increased glucose uptake into muscle, despite this time no difference in, in the clamp data. We did get an improvement in postprandial glucose tolerance, so the postprandial levels were coming down, and we didn't get an effect on HbA1c, but the group were well controlled anyway, so they were already within the target range for the UK. So that's not such a surprise. So when I mentioned that animals aren't necessarily a good model for humans, sadly, humans aren't often a very good model for humans either. And I think the message is, you know, as if we all didn't know this, you cannot extrapolate from a healthy, non-diabetic individual into a response in a patient because it just doesn't seem to work, okay? So when we look at, at, at from that data, so we had this, this dramatic, again, increase in glucose flux into muscle, but insulin sensitivity only improved in roughly half the group. 
you know. And what you do find is quite a lot of heterogeneity in a patient group, a lot more than you get in a healthy group. And we thought, well, is there anything about this heterogeneity that we can define based on their metabolic profile that would differentiate them to say, well, that's a responder, that's not a responder. So when we looked at their baseline, sort of um, RD, so their insulin sensitivity, there was no difference at all. So we couldn't predict, based on their starting insulin sensitivity, who was going to respond and who wasn't. There have been some, some other, other starches available, other, other, other groups doing this, and it does tend to be a very mixed bag. You know, as Mike mentioned, if you're going to look at the effects of resistant starch, you need to be looking at resistant starch and not energy dilution, and you need to have an appropriate control. And some of the studies just haven't used an appropriate control. This is a, a study I did find in diabetes. So they used native banana starch for weeks, and they used a control against soy milk. No idea why you would use soy milk as your control for resistant starch, okay? Another study, they had a, a, a mixed group where they were using a, a type 4 resistant starch and they just replaced the flour in a Hutterite community. I had to Google that. I've never heard of this. And it, in itself, it wasn't a badly designed trial, but nowhere in the paper did they quantitate how much resistant starch these groups were eating. So not only did they not find any effect on glycemia, they have no idea how much resistant starch they ate anywhere. So it would have been very hard to extrapolate any conclusions from this. The last study was in atherosclerosis. This was a mixed group of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Two types of rice. One they called their high glycemic, low glycemic rice with resistant starch. Very oddly described, very hard for me to tell actually what they fed them. And they did find reduced postprandial glucose. But from the paper, it did look to be entirely a GI effect and not actually a resistant starch effect. Okay. And this is a, a study in Lobley. And again, there was just no control. So you, you've got nothing to compare it with. So the strongest evidence tends to come from studies where you've only really changed one variable. You've controlled for GI. And most of these to date have come from type 2 resistant starch from HAMRS. Okay. Why is it an adipose tissue mechanism? You can either have less adipose tissue, you can change the function of the adipose tissue you've got, or you can change where you stored it, you know, in three simple, simple ways. Like what Mike, so to reiterate what Mike said, despite what the animal models show, resistant starch feeding does not lead to weight loss or change in body fat mass. And this is fat mass derived by impedance or MRI. We had a, a mechanism which was set up in Oxford to look at um, adipose tissue in situ. So you would cannulate the epigastric vein, you would measure adipose tissue blood flow, and you would measure substrate flux by arterial venous difference. We were able to show quite clearly that you would get a difference in efflux of glycerol and fatty acids directly from fat tissue. So not levels, but the, the rate of fatty acids and glycerol leaving fat tissue was altered. You had reduced adipose tissue lipolysis. And we know now, as Mike mentioned, this is a mechanism based on GPR 41, 43, and potentially short chain fatty acids as ligands. And of course, because of this, once you control the insulin, and this is in a low dose insulin infusion, you're actually getting more sensitivity in the suppression of lipolysis after resistant starch, even when you've maintained or you've clamped your insulin to identical levels. What do you get when you look at biopsies? What we found, we found some interesting things, not necessarily what we'd always expect, but things like we changed things like perilipin. You've got an almost doubling of a perilipin. You've changed adiponectin, which is important for insulin sensitivity, and things like LPL. And when we add this to the find, we find a 300% increase in glucose uptake into fat tissue in vivo. It looks like you're not only getting this drive for reduced mobilization of fatty acids from fat, but also a drive towards increased storage. If you're driving storage, does that mean you're going to get less ectopic fat? 
That's what, that's what the textbook tells us we're going to get. And no, you don't. So when you look at that with MRI, you get no difference with hepatic fat, no difference with pancreatic fat, and muscle lipid actually increases okay, in both insulin resistance and diabetes. And interestingly, that the muscle lipid is actually correlated with positive clinical outcomes. It was, pos it was correlated in insulin resistance with increased insulin sensitivity with clams. In the diabetic group, the more their triglycerides in the muscle went up, the lower their HbA1c went down. The future, I'm not going to mention much about this because there's another talk on this, but there's an awful lot of work now on the microbiota, and obviously resistant starch is prebiotic and it's highly fermented, okay? And if we're producing this much feces, it must be doing something, surely. And there's an entire cascade which was proposed by the groups in Louvain linking the bacteria with the gut barrier, with endotoxemia, and with low-grade inflammation and type 2 diabetes. This really has been understudied for resistant starch, so there's lots of potential here. We did show a reduction in TNF-alpha in our diabetic group, but obviously there's a lot of question marks which we need to, to fill in. What next? Well, it's a very small evidence base. Most of the studies are very small, but very detailed. And perhaps what we need is a much bigger study, but with more sort of defined normal clinical endpoints. Most of the starch research has been RS2. What about the other types? They might also have different effects. And we do need to work out what is the, the, what is the optimum dose times intervention length that you'd want to use. Because 40 grams is a lot you know, to try and incorporate into a diet. And obviously, we still need to try and translate into type 2 diabetes. Microbiota is important. Is it one of those things where in 10 years' time we'll have forgot it and moved on to something else? We don't know. But we do need large-scale trials if you're going to do microbiota because of the inherent variability. And do we need to keep looking at downstream targets? Because a lot of the technology, instead of looking at the composition of the microbiota, do you want to look at their functionality? Is that more important? Thank you.